Alrighty, it's uh, been a little while since I made a video, so I think it's time to do that. Um, here in AP, we're talking about uh, energy and its conservation. We're also talking about it in a regular physics class. Um, and the only difference between the two, well, other than the degree of difficulty of the problems, is just some notation. So this video is intended for the AP class. So um, I don't know why they split the two chapters up, chapter seven, chapter eight. You know, one of them's on work and kinetic energy, and the other's on potential energy. Um, and they also have a, a big deal about non-conservative and conservative forces. And I really don't think uh, that's a big deal either because you could always take care of your non-conservative forces just by calculating the work that is lost to them. So let's just go ahead and, uh, and encapsulate kind of what we've learned so far. Um, work is a force in action. It requires a force and a displacement, which I'll abbreviate with a D. This is a dot product, which is a vector thing which really means you could just do F times D times the cosine of the angle between them. Um, there has to be a causal relationship between the force and the displacement. You can't just go willy-nilly multiplying forces by displacements, but if it's the force that's actually doing the displacement or involved in the displacement, that's uh, that's there. Uh, then we had kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and a very simple recipe that never changes, one-half m v squared. This is a scalar quantity measured in joules just like work. And the work energy theorem uh, said that if you do some work, it can go into changing the kinetic energy. But if you do some work, it can also go into changing the potential energy. Now, potential energy has many different flavors. Potential energy is the energy of position, and um, the most popular one is gravitational potential energy, whose simple recipe is m times g times h. And for those who are clever, you notice that m times g is the weight of the object, which is the minimum force necessary to lift something, and h is the distance it has been lifted above the floor or whatever reference point you want to use. And so this is really just the work done to lift something up. Um, there is a potential energy of a spring, otherwise known as elastic potential energy, and that turns out to be one-half k x squared. K is the spring constant measured in newtons per meter. tells you how strong the spring is. X is the amount of the stretch. Be careful, you don't need to include the original length of the spring, just how much it's been deformed from its resting length. And I went over in the video about work why this recipe comes out to be one-half K x squared uh, for springs. Okay, so um, I've said all the important things there are to say, and and I've only said them once, so you know you might miss one or two of them. But as we do examples, we'll we'll get into this. And the basic idea is that the work can also go into changing the potential energy of something. So basically, uh, the law of conservation of energy. Uh, says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it can only change forms. Um, and I like to write it as the total energy is constant. But that's not always true. What we need is in a closed system. The total energy is constant. Now this closed system is the idea that you have to kind of isolate the things that are interacting with each other and and uh, and not have something come in from the outside because if you were studying say a shopping cart that was just sitting in a parking lot somewhere and it wasn't moving and you turned away for a second and when you looked back it was suddenly moving um there's a lot of different reasons why that might be you know maybe a, a child ran out from behind a bush and shoved it or maybe the wind started it moving but those are all things that come and interact and you have to include those in your system because they will do some work or give up some energy in order to uh, give the kinetic energy to the shopping cart that you just observed so we always need to make sure that we are, uh, have all the elements that are interacting with each other um, isolated in, in a closed system there's a bit of an argument you know geez is the universe a closed system um, if you define the universe as the everything, then yes, of course, it has to be a closed system. Um, but uh, uh, as we study the expansion of the universe, we think uh, that there is some dark energy, energy that we can't see. That's what dark means in cosmology. And uh, it is pushing the expansion of the universe and that would that would kind of be if we don't know what that is and we aren't including it in our closed system we're going to have some trouble with that all right get off the uh, the uh, <laughs> philosophical rant for a second um let's do some practical problems now uh, there's a uh, problem i like to do and i think i did this one in class and i call it the romeo and juliet problem in my telling of the romeo and juliet story uh, juliet is up here on her balcony she wears one of those conical princess hats and romeo is here below 
And um, in my telling of the story, uh, Romeo has a laryngitis, so he has written a love note to Juliet and wrapped it around a me medium-sized rock. And he wants to throw this rock up at some velocity, V, and he wants it to arrive up here by Juliet with zero velocity. He doesn't want to throw it at her, he wants to throw it to her. So he wants the peak of the trajectory to be up here where she is. Now her shoulders are seven meters above his shoulders. I'm going to go shoulder to shoulder because that seems like a reasonable uh, coordinate system here. In fact, I'm going to indicate that Romeo's shoulder level is h equals zero. Um, that's my origin. So uh, the question is, what uh, what velocity does Romeo have to throw it with? Um, and so if we think about this, we know that Romeo will do some work. The rock will then acquire kinetic energy, and as it rises up, it will lose that kinetic energy, and when it gets to the top, it will have potential energy. And the work done by Romeo will be equal to the kinetic energy the rock has, will be equal to the potential energy it has at the top. This is the law of conservation of energy. So work has changed the kinetic energy of the rock, and then that kinetic energy has changed through the process of flying upwards into potential energy. Now, if we focus just on this last part, we can actually solve the problem because one half of the rock's mass times its velocity squared will be equal to mass times g times h. Now, it has this velocity at the bottom, has the height at the top, but if the energy is constant, then its energy at the beginning will be equal to the energy at the end of its trip. The mass is canceled, which is an interesting feature. And it doesn't really matter um, to this process how massive the rock is. It, it will matter when Juliet grabs it, and it does matter to Romeo, who has to throw it. Uh, if he's not strong enough to uh, exert the correct force, then he won't be able to throw it. But for this process, um, it doesn't matter. It cancels out. And so we have uh, that V squared equals 2GH. I've moved the 2 to the other side of multiply by 2. And the velocity that he has to throw it at is the square root of 2GH. And for the numbers that I gave you in this problem, that turns out to be, oh, I don't know, 11.8 meters per second using a G of 10. And... Um, that's a reasonable number to be able to throw a rock. That's uh, a little faster than the fastest people can run, but we all know that you can throw an object faster than someone can run. The entire game of baseball is predicated on the idea that you can throw a baseball faster than someone can run to base. Now, in my story, oh, by the way, before we continue the story, all we are doing is identifying what kind of energy is present at various locations. Now, we could have identified the rock in the middle and we could have said, well, now it's going to have a mixture of kinetic and potential energy. And that would have made the problem a little more difficult, a little more algebra over here. But it is true that this number, the sum of these two numbers, this number and that number, are all the same number of joules. So let's try another situation, see if we can do any better. Um, in the second half of the story, Juliet decides that she is displeased with the contents of the note. Perhaps Romeo has made many spelling and grammar errors doesn't know the difference between theirs. And so she decides to return the rock at 10 meters per second. She's not really gonna throw it that hard at him, um, but she's gonna throw it down at him and he is going to receive this rock at a much higher velocity. I'll call it V final. And I'd like to know what that velocity is. Now we could uh, reset and have H be equal to zero up here. That would work, and we might do that later on. But let's leave the H equal zero at the same location. It seems like a natural point. So in this telling of the story, or this part of the story, the rock has both potential and kinetic energy at the top. And when it gets down to the bottom at Romeo's location, it will have kinetic energy, but it will be a different kinetic energy, a higher number. It's the sum of these two numbers. So I want to put a little prime mark here so we don't think that those two are the same number. We don't cancel them out. When we write this down, the sum of the potential and kinetic energies, also known as mechanical energy, at the top will be equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom. M times G times H plus one half MV initial squared equals one half M v final squared okay and the m's all cancel again and we multiply through by two and we get two g h plus v i squared equals v f squared and so we can put the numbers in here two g h uh, that wound up being 140 last time two times seven times ten and v i squared is ten squared so that's a hundred and that's equal to VF squared. So we get 240, we take a square root, and VF turns out to be 15.4, I believe. 
So yes, it's going to hurt a little bit when Romeo gets hit with the rock. That's uh, substantially faster than he threw it upwards. Uh, turns out to be about, I don't know, 38, 40 miles per hour. Now, one thing about this problem is that we might want to solve. Oops, I'm sorry, that was below the, the fold there, so now you can see what I'm doing. Um, one thing we might want to solve in this problem is how much time does Romeo have to get out of the way? Uh, but one of the things about energy, as great as it is for solving problems in physics, is it is terribly ignorant of time. Energy does not care about time. Um, there are going to be other things that we're going to study about physics that care about time, notably momentum, and we'll be able to, to patch this up. But if you want to find out how much time Romeo has, you really do need to drop back and use forces, accelerations, and the equations of motion. Um, I think the energy uh, way of solving problems is uh, much more elegant than the equation of motion way. But the equation of motion way, which you've already learned, physics boot camp, um, is always still valid. So if you get yourself in trouble, use it as an emergency method. Um, let's do one more thing here. Okay, let's figure this out. Um, let's do a problem involving an inclined plane. And I want to do it once without friction and once with friction. So we're going to have some sort of inclined plane. Um, let's put numbers in this thing. Let's make this a 20 degree incline. Let's put this object on here and let's have it be a five kilogram object. And let's have it slide down a distance D down the plane. And let's make that um, three meters. Okay, and there's going to be no friction in this case. Now over here, we're going to do the exact same problem. And um, Oh, Harmon, you are a delightful artist. Okay, uh, this is going to be the same 5 kilograms, the same 20 degrees, the same 3 meters, and uh, but this time we're going to have a mu of 0.1, and this thing is going to slide down. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, there's a lot of different ways to solve this. Um, we could identify that this box has potential energy at the beginning and when it gets here to the end it will be moving and it will have kinetic energy so the potential energy it has at the beginning equals the kinetic energy it has at the end m times g times h equals one half m v squared and by the way we're solving for what the velocity is at the bottom there we go so um M's cancel, move the 2 to the other side, and we have 2GH equals V squared, or V equals square root of 2GH. Now, H is not something I know, but I can get it from a triangle, because I have the hypotenuse of the triangle being 3 meters, and the uh, angle of the triangle being 20, so this is really going to be square root of 2GD times the sine of 20 degrees. And we'll put those numbers in, 2, 10, 3 sine 20 degrees, all under a square root, and we're going to get an answer as soon as I find my calculator. Okay, the calculator is on. 2 times 10 times 3 times sine of 20 equals, and now we take a square root of that answer and we get 4.53. So this box will be moving at 4.53 meters per second when it gets to the bottom. Now, you could have done that with the equations of motion by simply finding the weight and the amount of force that's in the down the plane direction. Then you would have found the acceleration and put that into an equation of motion. But I wrote every single step out and still it was faster. This one's gonna be a little different. We have some potential energy at the beginning and we're gonna have some kinetic energy at the end, but we also have some work done by friction that's gonna occur as this thing grinds its way down. Uh, and so to do this, we need to know how much work, how much energy we're gonna to lose to friction. And for that, we do need a free body diagram because we need to know the force of friction because work's recipe is force times displacement. So let's do a quickie free body diagram. Um, we're gonna have a normal force going this way. We're gonna have mg cos theta going this way we're going to have mg sine theta going this way and a frictional force going this way um, the frictional force which is what we're looking for here is going to be mu times the normal force which is going to be mu times mg cos theta 
Okay, so um, let's set this one up, and I'll go back to the blue pen, blue for energy, I guess. The potential energy minus the work done by friction is going to equal my kinetic energy. In other words, the kinetic energy I get at the end is going to be a little less than it would have been because I'm going to take my original budget for energy, which is the stored potential energy, and subtract away what I'm going to lose to heating up this surface. So this is going to be m times g times h minus, now the work done by friction is the force of friction, mu mg cos theta times the distance d, and that's going to equal 1 half mv squared. Okay, now h again is a d sine theta, and the m's all cancel, so let's, uh, and let's multiply through by 2. So 2 g d sine theta minus 2 mu g d cos theta equals, we got rid of the m's, we got rid of the 2, so that just equals v squared. And so v is going to be the square root of all this stuff, but let's figure this out here. This is a 2 times 10 times 3 times the sine of 20 minus 2 times 0.1 times 10 times 3 times the cosine of 20. And then we need to find this number and then we need to take a square root. So let's do that. This part we already did, by the way, but man, what the heck, we'll do it again. 2 times 10 times 3 times sine of 20. And then we're going to subtract away, parentheses, you know, 0.1 and 10 cancel each other, that's so 2 times 3 is 6, cosine 20, in parentheses. Okay, all that stuff subtracted and everything is 14.88, and that equals v squared, so we have to take a square root of this number, and we get a v of 3.86. And indeed, it is a little less than the original, so we get to the bottom with less velocity because we lose some energy to friction. All right, that's pretty much enough for today. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to chug around with these videos, and uh, we'll keep uh, moving on.